thank you everybody for uh, attending this. I know time is precious in the evenings, um, and so uh, I do value your uh, uh, time for me to give this presentation, and hopefully you'll get something out of it uh, from uh, from me. My background is I've been a foot, ankle and knee surgeon in Melbourne since 2000 and I've seen the light and made my way up to this beautiful part of the country, um, arriving last year and set up practice at the Pulse Building, which is next to uh, the private hospital and I operate out of Scuff and also Caboolture. I also uh, consult in North Lakes. So uh, I'm delighted to be here and as I said, hopefully I can get uh, something out. Now, Pam, do we need to highlight me? I think I need to, there we go, that's better. So I'm gonna be talking about conditions not to be uh, missed in the foot and ankle. Oh, sorry, that wasn't the right one. That's the one. Um, and so I'm really inspired to talk about this by one of my uh, mentors when I was a young medical student who said, you only see what you look for and you only look for what you know. So if you don't know the information, you can't see it. So I'll hopefully give you the information and you can look for these things that possibly may have been missed in the past because uh, the other thing is that you may not see them, but they see you. So the question is, which of these x-rays should you refer to me and which ones you can be confident in, in handling yourself and hopefully by the end of the talk you'll be able to uh, answer that. Injuries not to miss, the important ones are problems that are easy to fix now but difficult to fix later or problems that have long-term consequences and ongoing morbidity if they're not recognised. So the four that I'll be talking about tonight are perineal tendon instability, Liz Frank dislocation, tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction and osteochondral lesion of the tailored dome for those people following on the quiz, that could be the answer to question one. So perineal tendon instability involves dislocation or subluxation of the perineal tendons over the lateral malleolus. And usually it occurs as an acute traumatic event, but sometimes the patient may not recognize it. It may be chronic and insidious. Uh, the patient may not even realize they have it. And all they will report back is that they've got some pain or a snapping sensation. And the reason we want to uh, identify it is because as the tendon flicks over the back of the fibula, it can develop a split tear and uh, that's an extra pathology. So it usually occurs following an acute episode of ankle instability, so it's worth your while if you have somebody with a bad ankle sprain, just to have a think about the perineal tendons and a very quick examination will rule out any obvious uh, pathology. It can occur, as I said, recognise with chronic episodes of pain, a clicking or snapping sensation or just chronic swelling. Occasionally you do find it as an incidental finding in an otherwise asymptomatic patient and that does present a dilemma because you don't know whether you should treat it or not. A little bit of anatomy, the perineal tendon passes through a fibro-osseous tunnel and it is a true fibro-osseous tunnel. It's quite uh, strong and you really need to uh, cut it with a knife to get in to see the perineal tendons. The superior perineal retinaculum, which is a Y-shaped structure, stops subluxation as the tendon passes behind the uh, fibula. There is also a groove in the back and that's demonstrated here with the superior retinaculum here and here, and the tendons run behind in a groove behind the, the fibula. Instability comes from either stripping of the retinaculum from the fibula, which is the most common form, and the tendon will then pass behind the edge of the fibula, but because of the tendons are not free, it will stop just behind the, sorry, just in front of the back edge of the fibula, so it doesn't flick all the way forward. And that's the most common thing, and that's why patients don't recognise it. Tearing is much less common, and when that happens, the tendon will flick all the way to the front of the, uh, the fibula, and it's quite obvious. Occasionally, that uh, fragment of uh, the, the uh, retinaculum will tear off a fragment of bone, and that's seen on X-ray, and uh, that can be one of the signs of perineal instability, but it's, it's a pretty uncommon finding, and if you get that, then you've done very well. Recurrent instability can cause laxity in general, uh, and those patients may have uh, perineal instability as part of a whole lateral ligament instability complex, and then patients who are born with a very hypoplastic groove who have subluxated their whole life, and the question is whether you need to do anything about them. 
Examination concentrates on the area behind the lateral malleolus where there's usually swelling and tenderness. And you ask the, move, ask the patient to move their foot from plantar flexion to dorsiflexion and eversion and feel for the tendon behind the uh, fibula. And it's quite obvious to feel the tendon contracting and you'll be able to feel whether it comes out of joint or, or not. If the foot is acutely swollen and, and painful, then just put the foot in an eversion and ask them to place the foot in dorsiflexion and eversion to contract the uh, tendon and you can feel whether it's going to stay in the groove or not. And don't forget, this is usually uh, part of an instability picture. Plain x-rays are usually carried out as the patient's often had an, uh, an unstable ankle injury. Look for that flake revulsion, but generally they're normal. Dynamic ultrasound is the best form of investigation, but you really need to ensure that you've got a, an experienced musculoskeletal ultrasound, not someone who just looks at uh, pregnant, pregnant women all day. And make sure you write on the request, query perineal tendon instability, so they know exactly what to look for. Otherwise, they'll just do a general examination of the lateral ligament normally. MRI, again, is uh, good, but it's not dynamic. And if the tendon is not subluxated at the time, the, the um, stripping may not be uh, uh, obvious. If there's a complete tear of the retinaculum, then the radiologist should pick that up. This is the classification. So you see the normal structure. This is the lateral side with the retinaculum. And there is a fibrous ridge that sits there that deepens the groove with the two tendons. This is the common form where you strip from the superior perineal retinaculum. So the tendon will go into this groove and get caught there. So it's not behind the fibula, but it's not way in front. If you get these uh, complete tears, the tendon will go all the way around to the front and is quite obvious. Uh, this is the one where you might see the flake of bone, but unfortunately it's quite uncommon. Uh, Non-surgical treatment uh, often is instigated by physiotherapists and the like, but really does it solve the problem as the, the stripping is not going to repair itself. Um, in a, a, some occasions, uh, cast immobilisation may be indicated, but surgery is generally the uh, treatment of choice, and it's a very uh, satisfying operation as you can go in and, and physically repair the uh, retinaculum uh, and usually has a very high rate of success. Occasionally, if you've got someone with a hypoplastic groove, you may deepen the groove, but that's unusual. So it doesn't project very well, but that's where you see the little flake of bone in the type 3 injury. Uh, and it's different than the one you see on the end of the fibula from a, an avulsion of the lateral ligament. So these are demonstration. This is this type 1 where the tendon is going to sublux out. I've pushed it out and can push it back in. And it's surprisingly pain-free for the patient. And then this is the one where the, the tendon flicks all the way out as the patient moves into dorsiflexion. And, and really everybody, the patient will notice that, whereas you can see on the one on the left, the patient may not even notice that the tendon's slipping out of place. Dorsiflexion exacerbates the tendon subluxation, so you can see that it's sublux here, looks worse in dorsiflexion, but it actually, oh, sorry, it actually reduces when you go into plantar flexion. So you've got to think of it and you've got to examine the patient with resisted dorsiflexion or in dorsiflexion, otherwise you may miss it. And this is what we're trying to avoid. This is a tendon that's been split as it's flicked over the posterior aspect of the fibula, it catches on that sharp edge and it uh, gets this longitudinal split in it, uh, which we then repair and uh, it does reasonably well. Next, I'll move on to list frank joint injuries. Now, these are almost always missed. It's, it's said in the literature that up to 40% are missed, even by experienced orthopedic surgeons. This rank was actually in the polyanic podiatrist and he worked before their day of x-rays, and he used to see these injuries when horses were hamstrung, and the patient's foot would come down in the stirrup in this position, and the horse would land on top of them, uh, creating a severe deformity. And he used to amputate through the midfoot, which would then allow the patient to uh, continue and uh, walk in the future rather than having a painful uh, foot. 
the tarsal, I mean, a tarsal joint, so the anatomic name for the uh, Liz, Frank ligament, uh, Liz Frank joints. And the Liz Frank ligament itself extends from the medial canal form to the base of the second metatarsal. But there are a number of other uh, ligaments connecting all of the uh, tarsal metatarsal and intertarsal joints. The second, the fifth in particular, have very strong ligaments joining them. So when they dislocate, they tend to go as a unit, all going in one direction, mainly lateral. There are no ligaments directly connecting the first and second metatarsals, so they all often commonly diverge with the first going dorsally and the second to fifth going laterally. So here's the anatomy. These are the list rank joints here, and these are the, the ligaments. And you can see there's a number of ligaments, and this is the, the so-called named ligament that we all look for, but in reality, um, you have to dislocate all of these ligaments and tear them for the whole unit to go. Now, I'm not going to talk about the traumatic group uh, secondary to Charcot and diabetes. They're an entirely different kettle of fish. I'm talking about someone with a normal foot who then has an injury and suddenly has uh, pain. You can get a simple ligament stri uh, sprain uh, and you can get complete divergence of all of the joints dislocated and the foot looks very abnormal indeed. Uh, if you miss them, injuries to these joints carry a very high risk of secondary disability and instability in the future. So if you can get them, that's a really good get for that patient. The mechanism of injury is usually a sporting collision or a motor vehicle accident coming off a motorbike or something like that. Uh, most common in males aged 20 to 40, the risk taking age. And as I said, it's usually an axial loading, uh, especially if the, if the foot is planted on the ground. You can get a twisting injury, uh, patients who've landed from a height, often uh, patients who are in a boat and uh, the boat hits a wave and they fall and land awkwardly. Uh, I've seen quite a few of those. Direct force is pretty rare as a mechanism of injury. This is far more common whereby either somebody lands on your foot like that or you land in that direction and you can see that it just buckles at those Liz Frank uh, joints. So the patient with a sprain but no major disruption to the ligaments, it's basically the, the sprain that never gets better. Uh, usually it's localised to the midfoot very well uh, and um, it takes forever to get better. If you get this sign which is bruising on the sole of the foot, it's almost pathognomonic for a Liz Frank injury. So if you see that, then think about it. Uh, I've, uh, it's very common to get bruising in the dorsum of the foot, uh, but to just when you see that on the sole of the foot, especially in a patient who has done the injury several weeks ago, then think about Liz Frank uh, instability and disruption. Those who are presented with a complete disruption, it's usually pretty obvious because it's a major injury. They are unable to weight bear, get a lot of bruising and swelling. Uh, the part, the, you can hardly palpate them for several weeks. And when the bones are all out of position, the foot just doesn't look right. You can tell just by looking at it that something major is wrong. So uh, the, the major ones are easy. It's the minor ones uh, and the ones where there's only mild instability that are real difficulty to, to pick. And unless you think about it, you're not going to get it. So if you see a patient with big bruising like that and a big swollen foot, then you're going to get an X-ray nine times out of ten if that's going to have a major disruption. Uh, plain x-ray is usually the first investigation, but you must, must make sure that you get good quality views. Um, you might ask for weight bearing, but they're often too painful. And even if they say they're weight bearing, they're usually taking weight on the other foot. I'll go through the bony relationships in a sec, but if you see a flake of bone between the first and second metatarsal, that's usually that uh, Liz Frank ligament pulling off a little bit of bone uh, as an avulsion ligament, and it can be a nice little telltale sign. So these are what everybody should look for if you suspect Liz Frank instability. And these carry on all plain x-rays. The lateral border of the first metatarsal with the lateral border of the medial cuneiform, the medial border and the medial border of the intermediate cuneiform should line up. Likewise, the medial border of the third with the medial of the lateral cuneiform and the medial border of the fourth with the cuboid. 
So if they don't line up, then there's something wrong. This one here is a little bit soft in terms of the num number of millimetres, with, especially with digital radiology these days. But the way I always think about it is that there's a, usually a little notch in the fifth and it just sits there. Uh, it's pretty rare to get the fifth injured on its own, normally be part of the whole lot. But these are important to look for in plain x-rays if you suspect the Liz Frank subluxation. On the lateral film, make sure there's no step in the first uh, tarsal metatarsal joint and you should always see the fifth metatarsal under the first, otherwise there's been a uh, collapse of the joints. Separation of the first and second metatarsal is a, a soft sign because there are some people who have a natural separation that's more than the two millimetres. But if you have asymmetry between the left and right foot, then that's something to uh, take notice of. So here we see there's actually a fracture through the tarsal metatarsal joint. So in theory, it's not a true list bank subluxation of the ligaments. And this is treated a little bit different, but this one you can see there's no fracture and there's wide separation between the first and the second, and there's a step along that border there. So even with poor quality films like these, uh, you can see that there's uh, disruption to that list rank joint. And then obviously we get further imaging to uh, clarify. Stress views I think are historical these days. Uh, they have to be done under anaesthetic, um, but they uh, uh, will obviously show disruption. Bone scanning isn't always that helpful because there may not be much of a bony injury. In fact, the ligamentous list rank without a bony injury is a worse injury than if there's a fracture. Uh, ultrasound, again, it hasn't been very useful in the past, but the much improved ultrasound techniques may pick it up uh, even if they don't suspect it. CT is very good because it shows the bony architecture and weight-bearing CT really is the future. Um, I'm fortunate enough to own a weight-bearing CT in my rooms and uh, it's very useful to be able to compare weight-bearing with non-weight-bearing left and right in the one scans and uh, I can be either reassured or that I've made the right diagnosis um, or reassure the patient. MRI is useful, however, again, you need to direct the radiologist to your suspected diagnosis because they won't normally look at the Lisfranc ligament. It's an oblique ligament and they may have to do special views to look at it. So essentially with the MRI, if you direct the radiologist, they'll probably pick it up, but they may miss it. Now, Lisfranc sprain without disruption. So if you're happy with all your imaging, if the patient can hobble and, and wasn't that bad, they still need to be treated quite aggressively. And most patients are very sore and, and can't really weight bear much. So if you've got an acute case, don't hesitate to put them in plaster. Maybe not for six weeks, you might get them into a boot, but certainly don't hesitate to put them in plaster for two to three weeks just to let those ligaments start to gum up because what you don't want is late instability. The important thing in a Liz Frank sprain is to tell the patient this is going to take a long time to get better. And in fact, it's going to take months. You might not get back to sport for three to six months. You might not get back to work. And in a work cover injury, it's even more important because there's lots of pressures on the patient to return to work. Uh, usually full recovery with no long-term sequelae, but the patient has to be patient. If there is ligament rupture and bone instability, um, then you basically have to hold the bones together to allow the ligaments to heal. Uh, so that requires internal fixation and there's arguments between screws and plates and things like that. I now will open all of them up because inevitably there's a lot of joint debris and I think the more you can clear out of the joint, the better off the patient will be in the long term. Uh, I certainly treat these patients six weeks on weight bearing in a cast followed by a period in a cam walker and they're really looking at six months minimum to go back to significant sport. Um, the screw removal has become controversial, uh, but I take them out at six months because I don't want late instability. I figure that if you get them after six months, uh, instability, that was always going to happen. Uh, but the patients can't go back to uh, football and sports like that until they've had the plain screws out. Their foot just is too stiff. No matter whether or not it's a mild or a moderate or a severe injury, warn the patient they might get stiffness 
and osteoarthritis because we can't tell whether the cartilage has been damaged at the time of the injury and at five years down the track, they're going to get uh, pain and degeneration. Next I'd like to talk about is tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction and this is certainly a very common problem. Uh, usually presents in middle-aged females uh, and usually the diagnosis has been uh, missed by a number of people including podiatrists, physios and others. There is a grading pattern but the vast majority that we see are, are the grade two. Uh, they're, they're probably two-thirds of the uh, entire um, group. So they, these people will present with pain, swelling, and perhaps collapse of their midfoot. Now, it's much more common in people with flat feet already. So they may well not notice that their foot has collapsed even further. Uh, the pain is usually localised along the medial arch. And again, it's often blamed on the fact that they've got flat feet. Uh, it's usually chronic and insidious, and it's very common for a patient to report seven or eight years of pain before they come to me. And in fact, sometimes they'll report pain for some years and then the medial pain goes away and then they present to me with lateral pain. What has happened is that the tip post is stretching and painful. It's then given way, completely ruptured or stretched beyond uh, use and the pain goes away. They then have got a subluxated uh, subtalar joint and they develop either degeneration in the subtalar joint or subfibular impingement laterally and they'll present with lateral pain. Uh, but really the culprit is the tibialis posterior some years ago. Now, grade one is rare and in 20 years I've probably seen a half a dozen of them. Um, almost all are grade two and in the grade ones most have uh, required some form of uh, immobilisation and a cortisone injection and a couple have then gone on to decompression surgery but that's a very unusual beast. Uh, grade two and beyond require surgery because the tip post, whatever has caused it to degenerate is still going on, so you can't repair the tendon. Obviously, we need to distinguish from other sources of medial foot pain, so usually patients will end up with a barrage of investigations ranging from ultrasound, CT to MRI. When you examine the patient, usually the pain is very well localised to the tip post, which runs behind the medial malleolus and inserts mainly on the navicular tuberosity, but also onto other bones under the foot. So it's quite superficial and very palpable. There's uh, usually swelling within the uh, tendon and it looks like a bit of a sausage as it's in the, uh, the sheath. Get the patient with their back to you to perform a single and double leg heel raise, and I'll go through this in a few minutes. And what you're looking for is inability of the heel to move into varus when the patient rises to their heels and inability to perform a single leg heel raise. You can then test for isolated power of the tibialis posterior and I do that with the patient uh, sitting in the chair and I either have them cross one leg over the other and have them lift their medial foot towards the roof or else I just rest the leg on my knee, put the foot in uh, plantar flexion and inversion palpate the tip post and ask them uh, to, sorry, I'll be able to put the foot in uh, e-version and then ask them to resist me pushing and see if they can uh, resist uh, me trying to push the foot in e-version. So this is the tip post tendon as it runs and the side of the tendon this is usually distal uh, towards the insertion. Occasionally you do get pain around the medial malleolus, but that's unusual. So here we have a patient with flat feet. A uh, very common presentation, but this is physiologic flat feet. In other words, it's normal. And the way you can tell is that on the right hand picture, you can see both heels move into varus when they go to their toes and they reconstitute their arch. As opposed to this patient whose right heel stays in varus, uh, so you can see on, on this picture here, uh, valgus heels bilaterally. Here on the left, the heel move is, it moves into neutral, not quite various, but it's certainly different than that. Here on the right, the patient stays in valgus with a single leg heel raise. Now, they can still perform a single leg heel raise, but it's asymmetric, the right here compared to the left. And you can see on this view here, the heel is in valgus compared to this one in neutral. So there's asymmetry. So it's very important that you look at the patient from behind, have them perform a double leg heel raise, then ask them to perform a single leg heel raise on their good leg. 
And the way you do that is you get them to stand on their good leg flat on one leg, then go up. Because if you say perform a single leg hero, they'll leap up on both feet to one. You then get them to stand on their affected leg, lift the opposite leg off the ground first, then say, can you rise to your tires? And usually I'll have them up against the wall uh, for balance. So here is a uh, video of physiologic flat feet, watching for the uh, archery constituting when they raise. So you can see the arch comes back and the heels move into varus. And another uh, picture of the same, you can see the arch develops and the heel moves into varus, not quite as obvious on that one there with the angle. This one here is left tibialis posterior dysfunction. Now you can see already this one looks like it's in more valgus on the left than the right. But when they go up, the right clearly moves into varus, but the left doesn't. I'll just repeat that for you. So the left stays in valgus and the right one moves into varus. And that's almost pathognomonic of tip post failure. There are other causes, subtalar arthritis and the like. Uh, but that's tip post. And so if you see tip post failure, they need to be referred on because there is no other solution. And if they just battle on over the years, they will develop worsening arthritis in the subtalar joint and even the ankle joint. And that's a much more difficult problem to uh, fix down the track. The operation I perform for tip post dysfunction is transfer of the flexor digitorum longus tendon and I put in what's called a subtalar arthroresis screw to act like an internal orthotic and hold the heel in uh, neutral. And it's a very good operation uh, to solve the problem and get the patient back essentially to normal. Next, I'll talk about osteochondral lesion at the talus, osteo, of course, meaning bone, chondral meaning cartilage. Now, it often follows an inversion injury, but there's certainly a, a number of patients who develop this, and you ask them whether they've ever had any trauma, and they deny it. So it must be a true osteochondritis desiccans, which implies there's been something wrong with the bone or the bone's uh, blood supply. Uh, it's part of the differential diagnosis of the ankle sprain that won't get better. Of course, the syndesmosis injury is the other one of those. It's rare, but you might see a small fracture on x-ray. MRI is easily the best modality for uh, diagnosis in this kind of condition. So there's the little tiny flake. And the uh, lesions are always way more than the flake would imply. So you might have a large lesion here. So this is looking into the ankle. This is the Taylor dome, and this is a white lining cartilage, and this is this massive chondral defect. Now, in this particular patient, he was only 16, and he pulled a flake of bone on, and I was able to uh, repair it with fibre and glue, and he did exceptionally well, but that's rare. Mostly they'll have a flake of bone with them, and uh, it's usually a lot bigger than what would be indicated on that X-ray. Uh, again, if you suspect an osteochondral lesion, uh, organise an MRI and radiologists will almost certainly pick it up in every case. And patients 99 times out of 100 will need um, arthroscopy. And at arthroscopy, we debride the uh, lesion and remove any flakes of cartilage. I, I describe those loose flakes and the uh, flapping bits like a hangnail in that if you cut them off flush, then you're getting rid of that flapping uh, defect. If you see bone like that, we'll perform what's called microfracture. Basically, we get a, an awl or an ice pick type instrument, put a hole in the bone about three millimetres. The idea is that the stem cells underneath will come up and migrate in and fill that defect with fibrocartilage. You can't uh, replace lining cartilage. There are other operations for it, such as cartilage um, harvesting and uh, Reimplantation, but unfortunately there are big issues with uh, funding for those. So they're the conditions that I want you to make sure you don't miss. Now these are conditions that usually you can look after yourself if necessary with a bit of advice over the phone if we look at the x-rays. This is the Weber A or the, so the Weber B fracture is at the level of the joint line. A Weber A fracture is below the joint line and even if there's a little bit of separation and especially if it's way down here, this fracture can be treated conservatively, usually with a cam walking boot, weight bearing as tolerated, and most times, even if it doesn't heal with bone to bone union, the patient will get full, full function uh, back. I get hundreds of requests from GPs about 
sharp, uh, base of fifth metatarsals where they'll have this x-ray and then at six weeks, the radiologist reports that it's not healed. What are they going to do? And I say, well, what's the patient like? And I say, well, she's walking around all right, not sore. I say, well, let her go. It doesn't matter what the x-ray looks like in this part of the foot. As long as the foot is not painful and not tender and the patient go up on their toes and do their normal thing, don't worry about it. Because even if this completely evolves uh, and separates by a few millimetres, it can go on to a fibrous non-union, which will be pain-free and functional. Um, the Peronese brevis does insert partly on there, but it's got a very, very broad insertion. So it's not necessarily just onto the point of that. Fractures here at the tarsal metatarsal, uh, sorry, the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction or the Jones fracture are very different. So if they're outside of this box here, uh, it's better off to send them to me because they often go into non union, but anything in here almost always is treated conservatively and in the very, very few that don't uh, become pain-free or don't unite, we can always operate later on and um, the operation is just as good. So if I get a set of patients like that, I'll put them in a boot for symptomatic relief and usually by four to six weeks they're out of the boot and I often don't x-ray them again. I'm often called cool about little avulsions like this where you've had a patient who's rolled their ankle and it's reported as a cuboid fracture and you look and it's a little tiny avulsion like that. That really represents the ligament or the joint capsule between the calcaneus and the cuboid just pulling off a little bit of bone and they again can be treated conservatively as can little tiny impaction fractures of the neck and the talus and these which are very common, the little avulsion at the talonavicular uh, joint. So these we treat conservatively, it's just a little capsular avulsion and uh, the capsule is very extensive so you're never going to get instability at that joint. So going back to the original slide and if you want to look at question 15, who do you refer? Well this one here, osteochondral lesion of the talus, yes. Perineal tendon instability, yes. Little avulsions and impaction fractures here, no. Fracture the base of the fifth metatarsal, you don't necessarily need to, or this. This frank injury, yes. Now that's not to say that you don't want an opinion about them. So what usually I would suggest is you send an email or give me a call, say, look, can you look at this x-ray online? Have a look at it, and I say, yep, that's fine. It can be treated conservatively. All right. So thank you for that presentation, for your time and listening. Um, I thought we'd go through the quiz questions now and the answers. Um, Pam, if you're happy, I'll do that. So two conditions that have long-term consequences, perineal tendon instability, Liz Frank instability, tip post and osteochondral lesions. The structure that's damaged is the superior perineal retinaculum. The type of injury that causes perineal tendon instability is an inversion injury and especially a plantar flexion inversion injury. The sign on x-ray is the fleck of bone lateral to the fibula and uh, dorsiflexion flexion and eversion exacerbates perineal instability. Anatomical name of Liz Frank is the tarsometatarsal ligaments and the Liz Frank ligament runs from the medial canal form uh, to the second uh, metatarsal. Bruising on the sole of the foot gives you an indication of a Liz Frank injury and two signs, well, it's any of those widening of the space between the first and second metatarsal, loss of alignment of the second metatarsal with the uh, intermediate cuneiform, the third metatarsal with the lateral cuneiform, the fourth metatarsal with the cuboid, and on the lateral film, looking at the step of the first metatarsal or the, or the fifth metatarsal below the first, any two of those. How long would you advise a uh, sporting patient before they return to running and weight building sport? Well, it's really a minimum of six to 12 weeks. And their heart will sink, but it's better than saying three weeks. And at six weeks, they're saying, Doc, why aren't I back? And what will you warn you to flat foot is pathological rather than physiologic. Asymmetry is the first one. Lack of the heart arch reconstituting and um, 
uh, lack of varus movement in the single leg uh, here rise. Irritability of subtalar movement, rigidity of subtalar movement may be another one as well. And how should you examine a patient if you suspect a pathological flat feet from behind with them standing doing a heel raise manoeuvre? The heel normally moves into varus on a single leg heel raise, and that's mainly due to the action of tibialis posterior and the medial placement of the Achilles tendon. Osteochondral lesion, MRI is easily the best investigation. And which ones of those you refer on? The answer was A, B, and L. So hopefully everybody got 15 out of 15, otherwise I haven't done my job very well. So Pam, um, I thought now if you're happy, we can uh, go on to any questions you might have got by the chat and uh, any questions people might want to ask. Yes, certainly. So we have a question here from Dr. Matthias Folt from OK Health Medical Centre at Umundi. And he's asked, and you can add in here, Dr. Folt, if you'd like to, lateral retromalleolar para Achilles pain extension, pushing up a hill using flippers, etc. Well, it could be a perineal tendon instability or a more likely a perineal tendon pathology. Uh, I would be looking at a, a dynamic ultrasound as the first investigation if you think that it's uh, in the perineal tendons. The other um, one can be flexor hallucis longus, which runs directly behind the ankle. In our anatomy books, uh, we're always taught that it runs medially, but when you are opening an ankle and look directly through, the tendon you see is FHL, and it's a common dancer's injury behind, directly behind the ankle, and uh, so, yeah, so I'd be, I'd be looking at palpating the perineal tendons and isolating them. If you don't think it's a perineal tendons, then I'd be looking at isolating FHL. That's probably the most likely candidate. Usually the Achilles is reasonably um, obvious. If you get a good ultrasonographer, they'll, uh, uh, they'll um, be able to look at FHL. And the, I've had to treat that a few times, especially in dancers and uh, very active people. And it can usually be treated by posterior arthroscopy where we can get in and debride the tendon or release it from the uh, tight sheath that's in behind the ankle. Um, Dr. Fultz just added here, and you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself, Dr. Fultz, and add into the chat. It's been two years, fit man happened when running on sand. Yeah, and I saw that, um, and that would fit with FHL, especially on sand because you're clawing your big toe down, which is fine in the FHL. So I would be very suspicious of FHL tendonitis behind uh, directly posterior to the ankle. There's another question here from Dr. Sarah Caporal. Uh, just sorry, it just moved around. Um, there we are. In terms of timing of surgical referral for tibius posterior tendon instability, would you prefer they are referred as soon as it is diagnosed, even if they are managing with physio and analgesia? Is there no role for conservative treatment? In grade two and beyond, it's inevitable that they'll need surgery, but if they're un, what I call under control, and so that's a patient who's got an orthotic uh, and they are able to do most of their everyday activities. But often when you ask them, they'll say, oh, I'm going okay, I'm not too bad. And you say, yeah, but can you walk around the block? Oh, no, I don't do that anymore. So they'll have given up a lot of activities uh, because they can't do it with their foot. And if you say, well, would you like to be able to walk around the block? And I say, of course, yeah. Now, if someone's got such low symptoms, you're never going to operate on them, but you warn them that this is a progressive degenerative condition that will inevitably get worse. And when it's bad enough, come back and, and we'll talk about it further. What you don't want is them falling through the net and coming back five years later with bad arthritis of the subtalar joint. Any more questions from anyone? You're welcome to submit them via the chat or ask Dr. Burke directly. If you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Or you might have a patient that you, current patient that you might like to ask about. Dr. Bo, can I just ask you to say a few words about 
Morton's neuromas? Is there anything new yes. looking well, after them? Not really. I think it's the most overdiagnosed forefoot problem around. Basically, anyone who's got pain between their metatarsal heads is told they've got a neuroma. In my mind, it's only ever between the third and fourth metatarsal heads. There is a, another diagnosis called second metatarsophalangeal joint synovitis, and it's not always known, otherwise known as crossover toe. Very, very common, especially middle-aged females. And... To be honest, eight times out of 10, the patients have got that not Morton's neuroma. And the beauty of that condition is that it's treatable with an injection and taping and 95% cure without surgery. So Morton's neuroma, the important thing about the diagnosis is that it's much worse in tight shoes or shoes and it's never present in um, bare feet. Secondly, you don't get splaying of the toes like that in Morton's neuroma but that's what you get in your crossover toe, the MTP synovitis. Um, I've never seen an ultrasound that hasn't reported a neuroma or a bursa between the metatarsal heads, and MRI is equally as useless. Unless you've got a specific foot coil, you just don't have the resolution to see what you need to see. It's a clinical diagnosis. It's almost all on history. Uh, the examination, again, if you can be very careful, you can palpate between the heads of the metatarsal as opposed to the MTP joints. But in my experience, it's way overdiagnosed. It's, it's a bit of a throwaway diagnosis. Uh, and uh, MTP synovitis is far more common. Uh, you do see bursae between the third and fourth metatarsal heads, and they mimic a Morton's neuroma. And sometimes when you do operate, you go in and, and it's a, a bursa, but you take the nerve out anyway. Thank you. What's the age limit of um, uh, patients that you accept? Do you see children? I'll see, ad not really children, uh, adolescents. And the main things that I'll see with adolescents are things that are adult type problems. Tarsal coalition, um, accessory navicular is a common one. They present like tip post, uh, perineal tendon problems. So anything that mimics an adult, I, I, I'm not comfortable with, you know, syndromes and paediatric things because I just don't see enough and there's enough really good paediatric guys uh, to, to look after that. So really it's mainly, you know, 12 to 14-year-olds who are presenting with adult problems at an early stage, especially now that we're seeing so many heavy kids that uh, present, you know, basically as 80-kilo adults. That's precisely the kind of pa patients I'm actually referring to. Uh, I did print out their MRIs to ask you a few questions, whether to send you send them to you. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, I, I ran out in a rush just to make this <laughs> something, and I forgot it. So um, I think they meet that criteria. Um, heavy. Uh, Thirteen-year-olds uh, with ongoing foot and ankle injuries and. They've altered their sports uh, for the past, you know, 12 months, and it's not changed at all. And um, so, but the MRI keeps saying there's nothing, and yet, you know, they've got problems. Yeah, well, that's, I'd certainly be happy to see an 80 kilo 13 year old. I mean, there's sort of, I know children aren't mini adults, but these guys almost are. And just on a point, if any of you do have any cases you want to discuss with me, um, um, feel free to just email me the details with the, uh, with the x-ray company mm -hmm. and their name, and I can then look at the images online and uh, give you a call back. Uh, I'm very happy to do that, especially if it's going to save the patient a trip uh, to come and see me because I noticed quite a few of you, you know, a bit of an hour or more drive. So it would be, you know, much easier if I could look at it and say, oh, no, you don't need to do that or, or yes, get this investigation first just to save, you know, patients having – must annoy them no end having to do two or three doctor's visits. And that's why, for instance, I've got my weight-bearing CT scanner in the rooms. And because I own it, I'm happy I bulk bill every patient. And secondly, the results are available in five minutes. So there's no going away and coming back. And it's the only weight-bearing CT scanner in the whole of Queensland. So, uh, you know, it's been very, very useful to me over the last five or six years. Fantastic. So you said you're at Kabucha and North Lakes. Yeah, I'm at, I'm at North Lakes every second Thursday at the moment. Uh, obviously, I don't have my scanner there, but uh, yes, yeah, so I, I. But all the bookings are made through my uh, rooms, 
uh, number and um, I'm operating at Caboolture once a month. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Now, I can see a few more questions have come in. Uh, one's come in from Dr. Sarah Caparra. Would you like to come on and say that one or would you like me to read it out? Hello. Um, so I guess I was just asking about sonographers and places that you like to use on the Sunshine Coast. Um, I find that there's a wide variety of reporting styles that we get back. Um, who are your preferred places? Well, I'm afraid because I'm only so new, uh, I really can't advise. I mean, I barely know the suburb names now. So um, I'm using the person at Kiwana Imaging downstairs from me only because I'm just trying to gauge, you know, get them more experience and, and that sort of thing. The other problem you've got is that radiographers go from one clinic to another. So you might say, well, look, you know, this guy's a, a great guy. He's at, uh, at Kiwana or somewhere and you send a patient to Kiwana, but he's not there that day, he's somewhere else. Mm. So it is very difficult. And, and even when I was in Melbourne where I moved up from, uh, you know, I really only, only had two or three go-to guys. And I said, look, when you book in, you've got to book with this guy. And even then it's a problem because, you know, as you know, the radiographer is not in the room specifically for a lot of ultrasounds. So I think all you can do is give as much information on the request as you possibly can. Because, I mean, radiologists are very clever people and they are very experienced. It's just that they need to be switched on to exactly what you're looking for. So whenever I write a radiology request of any sort, I write a paragraph. You know, I'll give half a history saying, you know, this is where the pain is, this is what, it, uh, what I'm suspecting, can you rule this out? And really direct them so that they've got an idea because, you know, they're just sitting in a dark room bored all day and, 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 you know, they don't know what to look for if you don't give them any clues. Okay. Thank you. Ask me in five years and I'll be able to tell you which ones are good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 